we're already in the stage of like decentralized information. Yeah. And like even me, you know, I put out content, you know, to showcase the realities of how countries are. This is the Mooncast. All right, guys, so we are live, and today I'm here with... Aniket. Aniket. Aniket, and Uke. Your last name is what? Uke. Uke. Yes. And so can you just a little bit introduce yourself to the audience about who you are, what you do, when you got to Rwanda, and how that transition has been for you from the point, from the point when you got, and um, how you're able to adjust with the culture and everything? All right. So um, my name is Aniket Uke, yeah. as I mentioned, and uh, I'm a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, focus major, uh, focusing in producing and assistant directing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recently got the title of uh, a photographer. Mm -hmm. I photograph when I specialize in humanitarian photography, mm -hmm. human interaction and uh, portraits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been part of over 100 documentaries. Wow. In the last five years and over 1000 interviews. Yeah. And uh, Feels good. I came to Rwanda the very first time was in 2003. Yeah. But then uh, that's when my when I came for a vacation to see my parents. I was living in India, and I came to Rwanda. Like I moved to Rwanda in 2008. Mm. And uh, being uh, at a very tender age, I was not really focused on the transitioning part. Mm -hmm. I was not very aware about what a transition actually means. Yes. And uh, I was just happy to be like, you know, a different country, different people. And uh, the very first time in Rwanda was very, really nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was always looking forward to, I was always, I was always be looking forward to vacations because mm -hmm. my parents were here. So I would come and see them here. Yeah. And that's how my childhood went from 2003 till 2008. Mm. I made my trips to Rwanda and 2008, that's when I decided to move here. So when you talk about the transitioning period and you know the language barrier, yeah. how was that for you in school and how were you able to overcome that? So I went to an international school. Okay. So most of them, like almost everyone was an English speaker. Okay. And uh, in terms of language, I was able to adjust very quickly because mm -hmm. uh, I first got my grip over Kiswahili, Swahili language, yeah, Swahili. and which was mo commonly spoken, Yeah, like to get your way out of anything, move in the market, negotiate with a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And I always used to have uh, Kinyaranda classes in school mm -hmm. and at home. And during that time, I was, I got a good grip on Swahili. Because a lot of words of Swahili were derived from Hindi, mm. the Indian national language, mm -hmm. like subui, mm -hmm. that means morning. Yeah. In Hindi, it's subeh. Wow. So I didn't know that. That was very, it was very common. And then yeah. uh, a lot of words were common. And then uh, my parents are good Swahili speakers. Mm. And through them and through their colleagues and mm. the staff, I got to learn Swahili. Wow. And for Kenya Rwanda, I say I would say my grip on Kenya Rwanda was not till I graduated high school. Hmm. Once that happened, I was in the market, I was moving around and I could understand a lot, but it was very difficult for me to speak. Hmm. I would end up saying the wrong words, I would end up pronouncing wrong things. Hmm. And but I overcame that and it has been a smooth transition ever since. Did you face any kind of discrimination? No, no. None at all. Rwanda has been very welcoming. Yeah. And mm. what about what about the because the development, right? Yeah. This is what I really want to get into because you've been here since 08. So you've seen a huge shift and transition in terms of development from the moment you got here until now, currently in the present. So can you speak to how the city has transformed over the last fifteen years? Oh, the city has transformed immensely. Yeah immensely. I remember, I would recall there was only one or two buildings. Yeah. I would go ahead and name City Plaza. Mm -hmm. And then there was Centenary House, mm -hmm. which are still there, which yeah. are still in town. 
and I think other infrastructure and other buildings were under construction. Mm -hmm. I remember very vividly that I would be convention center. Yes. Now the iconic landmark of Kigali mm -hmm. was under construction when I used to go to school. Wow. So I always used to pass that road yeah. and uh, Kigali Heights was not there. Mm -hmm. And we only had that one single way with, with the main roundabout. Yeah. And we, the development has been really well. Yeah. And I would say it, it's remarkable what Rwanda has achieved. Yeah. In it's terms of development, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in yeah. terms of uh, safety. Yeah. I mean, coming to the safety point, being the number one country, the one, no, the safest country yeah. in the entire continent. Yeah. It's it's achieved by great leadership and mm -hmm. other things. Absolutely, like, man. Yeah. I, I wanted to transition into dating because um, we spoke about it a little bit earlier, and yeah. uh, I, I kind of want to get into it. So let's just. Cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. You are an Indian mm -hmm. in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Has it made any kind of difference for you in regards to dating? Are you dating the Rwandan woman? Have you dated some of the Rwandan women? Are you more so traditional and looking for like an Indian woman? How has that been specifically for you? Uh, so me, I, I would say I would I would burst the myth there. Okay. So a lot of people usually ask me yeah. that if my family is inclined towards me dating an Indian person yeah. or an Indian lady or and that's so one of the factors that comes in that when ladies are slightly shy yes approaching like okay like he's an Indian and then uh, maybe approaching him might not work out well because mm -hmm. they only there's this myth that Indians marry Indians Indians yes. date Indians but that has not been the case with me Hmm. I have been around uh, a lot of front and female friends. Yeah. I've went out with a few of them. I've, which is fine. And it's a very, I think uh, the cultural factor does come in at some point. Hmm. But if you put that aside, I mean, love knows no language, love knows no barrier. So, yeah. That's, and with the women specifically, I just want to get into this because my audience likes these types of topics. Right, right. <laughs> How has it been in terms of how you approach women in mm -hmm. Rwanda? Also, would you consider them wifey type material? Mm -hmm. Also, would you say that there is a little bit of friction in regards to, does the family have to approve of you specifically? I mean, uh, each family has a different view. Yes. Mine does not. Yeah. My family has been very open. I think uh, it, it also boils down to exposure mm -hmm. of one's family and oneself as well. Yeah. I would say being a wifey material, yeah. Uh, back in the days, I would actually just recall this back. I was doing stand-up comedy at yeah. one point of my life. And there was a skit that I had written. Mm -hmm. This is not to target anyone or point fingers or, or just generalize the public. But uh, we would say that there are three types of uh, ladies you find in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Good ones. Yeah. The ones who are career-oriented. They support the men in the career. Mm -hmm. The nice, they ha have good values, good ethics. Those are good ones. Yeah. Then the bad ones, yeah. which which are everywhere. Yeah. And there's good, there's bad. Uh, bad ones, I would say, toxic ones who stick around, like who want to be pampered all the time, yeah. who want to be looked after all the time. Which is not a bad thing, but uh, at times uh, in a relationship, if you are looking towards equality. Yeah you you balance it out yeah that's that's what i would say mm. and then the the third one there are ladies who are looking for free food <laughs> i understand <laughs> so there are, there are ladies who are looking for free food yeah yeah and uh, i remember one incident when this lady was dating three different boys yeah so she could have breakfast mm -hmm. lunch and dinner <laughs> And one of them was a barista, so she could have her afternoon coffee. <laughs> and th th and th this this is uh, this is a true story. It's, it's yeah. based on true events. What I'm telling you. Yeah. So this lady was dating three different, four different guys, mm -hmm. so that her three meals and one coffee would. It be sounds served. like the states. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, people are almost everywhere. Everywhere the same, the same yeah, right? Yeah. There's only different slight nuances between yeah. them. Like I would say, like the 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 marriage, uh, the wedding we attended where yeah. we met. Yeah, yeah. That lady was in the good category. Yeah. I've known her for over ten years now. Wow. Sarah. Yeah. I've known her for over ten years. I I remember 
when we she got her acceptance letter mm-hmm. and we went to pick it up yes for her to become a doctor and when she was flying yeah to china to study medicine mm mm-hmm. and she is a good girl yeah. i mean anyone would be lucky to marry her yeah then there are others that you know you just can't tolerate yes and for me it has been about 5 years that i've been not in a relationship mm-hmm. but i've just been gathering experiences with uh, different nationalities different yeah. ladies different people yeah to get to know what what people actually want when it comes to the economics here how would you describe it would you say that economically speaking it's on the rise there's a lot of opportunity here you can grow here the diaspora should come back how do you sort of perceive it i mean the economy is growing yeah no doubt yeah they and i think uh, for me to not say that diaspora should come back diaspora is actually coming back yeah i've i've met about 10 people this year mm-hmm. who have left states who have left europe and the back in rwanda and then mm-hmm. they've started or they've bought something they've bought an out of box thought and are now implementing it in rwanda and are booming it yeah so i would say economy is really on the rise yeah and it's on one self like how they see it yeah and how they want to perceive it yeah like you know you cannot be you cannot come to a country and then expect all the business to come through you yes but you also need to work hard towards it absolutely so that's that i would say yeah. if you have something different yeah. and i think rwandans and rwanda is always looking for something that can contribute that can complement yes the economy instead of competing with it yeah and when it comes to how easy it is to start a business mm-hmm. how would you say that is like that process and also is there a lot of corruption as another thing i want to ask you to as well like what what would you say honestly about the corruption here so the corruption uh, i would say corruption yeah. equals to zero in rwanda wow okay like that's that's it's period there is yeah. no corruption at all yeah i like i've been in rwanda since 2008 yeah my dad has been in rwanda from 98 yeah and uh, that was post uh, a few po- a few years post uh, the war yeah and we have never come across any incident or any official uh, asking for a promoting corruption yeah there was i've always seen campaigns of i remember as a kid having uh, uh, coming across this campaign called ruswa oya mm-hmm. which means no corruption or say no to corruption mm-hmm. and on the part of registering business mm-hmm. it's fairly very easy. Yeah. once uh, it's like you have a certain uh, you have a certain capital well, and one thing that i really like about rwanda in terms of businesses is that you don't need to have a big capital to start a business in Rwanda that's really good everyone is welcome you go to the register general's office that's mm. the at Rwanda development board mm-hmm. rdb they it's now also online yeah you register your business online within 72 hours within 24 to 72 hours your business is registered you get a registration certificate Mm. and you're good to go. I mean I heard you can even get it as quickly as 6 hours. That too. That's insane. Yeah. But in regards to the foreign direct investment, so if foreigners wanted to invest here, they would it would be safe for them to be able to like buy property or get into businesses and stuff like that. I'm I'm not very sure about the the uh, the buying property part because mm-hmm. I have personally not bought a property okay. yet. Okay. Okay. But I am looking forward to. Yes. Hopefully this hopefully the coming year. Yeah. and uh, i think it should be easy because i've seen uh, a lot of foreigners a lot of people from the indian community buying purchasing property here and a lot of foreigners purchasing properties and investing in real estate and apartments like real estate and then manufacturing lines yeah. factories and all this has been developing you've been here in since 08 and so i want to ask you about because you've obviously traveled to different countries in africa Can you talk about your travels a little bit about how it's been depending on which country and the differences and nuances between them in culture and lifestyle? I would say the other countries that I've traveled to Uganda, mm-hmm. Kenya, Tanzania. Mm-hmm. And if I compare them to Rwanda, it's that Rwanda is more organized. Yeah. Rwanda has more systematic order mm-hmm. that you know and there is no foul play that happens yeah not that it happens in other country i've like visited them but i've not 
seen like the bureaucratic uh, the bureaucratic system or anything mm-hmm. but what i see from rwanda is it's more organized uh people are more friendly mm. in the other countries also but in terms of cleanliness i think yeah. rwanda beats everything yeah like all the other countries that i've been to in in africa yeah i was talking with cedric and he yeah he was telling me that on the last saturday of every month yeah they do a national cleaning yes and it's like mandatory and everybody has to go outside everyone has to. can you walk me through how that process works is it like from a certain time frame to a certain time frame does it depend on if you have work or not like how does it all work so uh, so the way it has been pra- it has been practiced all over the years is that half half day yeah. like from 8 to 12 mm-hmm. four hours so every area has a community has an area leader Mm-hmm. that marks the attendance of everyone mm. and they all gather around and then they it so it's more like saying charity starts at home yeah so cleanliness also starts begins at home yeah so you first clean your home then you walk come onto the roads and then a community cleaning takes place yeah so every community every area gathers around people gather around the leader marks the attendances and then they clean up the place that's amazing, man. And I wanted to switch over to photography and the documentaries that you're doing and everything. Yeah. But before I get into that, actually, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because you said you've done over a thousand interviews. Is that that you've partaked in them actually, or you were part of the film and production aspect of it? I would say I have, uh, I've partaken in the interviews. Yeah. Like I've interviewed, I've interviewed maybe half of them yeah. or less than a half, or maybe let's say. 25% of them mm-hmm. and I have been part of a thousand interviews mm-hmm. or close to a thousand interviews I would say in that like I've been part of the production process from beginning to the end I have been assigned to go and film the interviews I've been assigned to conduct the interviews mm. that. so do you are you basically well versed in sort of how the film industry works here specifically yes and so have you met some of the celebrities or people that, that some of the actors and major people that start major roles here? I have, I have uh, worked with uh, one of them very closely. Yeah. Uh, he's called uh, Bamenya. 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 Okay. Bamenya. He's a, he's a comedian. Yeah. And he has his own series. Yeah. He has his own comedic series and then he posts online. Mm-hmm. And I got to meet him through a brand. Mm-hmm. He was the brand ambassador and we were filming a TVC for the brand. Yeah. And uh, we have worked with him on a few projects. Mm. He has a big star. Uh, he has a big uh, fame here. Mm. Others, I would say I've worked with other actors from the industry. Mm. And but it has not been like a major, like uh, the way industry is still on the rise. Mm-hmm. There's no like a major star or someone. It's not like Nollywood. No. Okay. Not, okay. No. Yeah. And is there also, how does it work here? Because I have to ask, is there like equality with the women and the men? And so women can enter the workforce, work just fine, everything super normal. Very, very okay. normal. Actually, I would say even uh, there are a certain institution where the women are actually more than men. Wow. Yeah. But do you know why that is? Is that just because men are a little bit, would you say, less ambitious than the women? No, I would, I would, uh, I would say not, not that because uh, men are equally ambitious. Yeah. But it's just that I think uh, women, there are certain sectors when women are well versed, as mm-hmm. you would say. Yeah. And they, they tend to take certain uh, roles and responsibilities better than a man would. Yeah. I would say like in the teaching sector. Mm. I mean, most of the teachers growing up have been females. Yeah, so things like that everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, when, when, in, when in a place like Rwanda where, where people are learning, mm-hmm. I think women are in a better position to teach. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to the quality of the education here, how can you speak to that? Like, would you say it's similar? Have you studied also a, a little bit abroad? Yes, I have. Where, where specifically? I've studied in India. Okay. I've studied in Mauritius. Okay. And would you say there's any bit of a difference between the different locations where you've studied? I would say each each country has its own uh, nuances. Yeah. Uh, India Indian education system it it's again it's at the top of the globe I think. Yeah. And uh, 
the only thing uh, that happens is in India, because of the population, mm. teacher is sort of not focused on one or two students because mm -hmm. a class would have I, I remember growing up while while I was in school in India I would, we would have 45 60 students wow in one class yeah it's not optimal at all yeah and yeah. when I came to Rwanda my class had 15 students hmm. super optimal and uh, so teacher is able to focus on every every student yeah they are able to pay attention to every student they they get to know the student like what the what's the perk of the student is yeah. what the grievance is and and they're able to work it out that way when it comes to because you've been doing photography for what like in the docu-series and stuff like this for what five about, years? about five years five years how did it all start out and just tell, walk me through the entire journey of that so it started off as uh me finishing high school yeah and uh, me having a dilemma of what to pursue yeah and I was, I was a big engineering fan. I really wanted to do software engineering. and But then certain things were not really adding up. Mm -hmm. And uh, then one day I was watching a film I, before bed. And I think I had, I had filed up my application papers mm -hmm. for an engineering college. And the next day was the submission. Yeah. And I'd, so while uh, filing the papers, I was watching a film. And something just clicked in my mind. I'm like, you know what? I think I want to pursue modeling. <laughs> and uh, my mom uh, was in the fashion industry. Before. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. So well, she, she, she was, she was a designer. Okay. She was making that. Yes. Okay. And uh, she, no, no, uh, I would not say a designer per se, but like my mom had a clothing store mm. and she would showcase her collections to the yeah. fashion show. Like she was not particularly designing. Yeah. And, um, I remember attending fashion shows with her mm -hmm. and there was one of the models that I s had spoken to and Facebook was very new that time. Yeah. And I had his Facebook, yeah. Facebook contact with me. Yeah, he's showing your age and, a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and I called the, and I, and I texted the guy on Facebook. I'm like, Hey, you know, I want to pursue this. And mm -hmm. he's like, you know what, uh, go to this, this guy and he'll, he'll help you out. And I did. Yeah. And I told my parents, they were not entirely happy with the decision, Yeah, my father. But then uh, later he was like, you know what, uh, now that if he wants to do that, yeah. let let him do that. Yeah, uh, Let's see how it works. Mm -hmm. So I spent about one year learning, modeling, posing, <laughs> behaving in front of the camera. And you got a couple of pictures that you can show me later. After that. I, definitely, definitely, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I sure. remember my, my first fashion show was for Rwanda clothing. Okay, okay. It was a brand. It's a sort of made in Rwanda brand. Mm. And from there, I never looked back. Yeah. And I think I later went on to pursue bachelor's in computer science mm -hmm. in software development mm -hmm. and implementation. Yeah. I secured the degree just for the sake of securing it. Yeah. And, uh, but, and I kept having different jobs as well as I was pursuing my degree and I was also pursuing modeling. Yeah. So whatever was happening in my life, whether it was a job, whether it was anything, modeling was still a part of it. Yeah. I never left it. Yeah. I was like no matter how, how slow the industry was or how young the industry was, yeah. I think it was making the right choices, meeting the right people, mm -hmm. keeping the right contacts. Did it, did it pay well? It's more net for networking, right? Or it's, it it was like it so again it depends on uh, wh how how contented one is mm -hmm. for me it was n not really about the money part yeah it was more about being out there yeah it was more about getting no people getting exposure exposure basically yeah. i'm like you know if someone sees me and then you know i, I would always uh, read about a certain models who who were spotted in a supermarket and yeah. who were who were just going shopping somewhere and they're like, you know what, a casting agent spotted me. And, yeah. and I think those were the more successful ones yeah. than people who were actually pursued modeling. Mm -hmm. And after that, I, I kept, it kept happening. And then I met a very, I met the certain director mm -hmm. who's, uh, who I now work with. Yeah. And I, it was during a shoot. I remember very vividly we were, we were filming a commercial and, uh, after the commercial wrapped, I, I expressed myself. I'm like, you know, I would like to be part of your production. Mm. And he's like, okay, that 
now that you have expressed like we can we can talk about this mm. and uh, he told me to give him two weeks uh, two weeks time because mm-hmm. he was going to edit the commercial that we that was just shot yes and was going to be delivered in the two weeks mm. and those two weeks turned into one and a half year because <laughs> we kept having a back and forth yeah and we we would be talking on the phone and kept having a back and forth back and forth we'd have meetings but we were not getting something solid yes like you know i was not able to join school and then one afternoon i remember i was supposed to head back for lunch at home mm. and uh, i called him and i told him that his colleague had called me and uh, who was looking for me and then who i was supposed to join as as the logistics manager yeah. for that agency and then uh, but since i didn't have any logistic manager's experience so he had he had not recruited me then i told him i'm like you know this has happened and i'm like why don't you put me on your crew mm. he's like you know what come 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 and see me in the next one hour mm. and after five minutes as i was heading home i get a call from him again he's like can you, can you make it in 30 minutes i'm like sure i grabbed a bike a motor mm-hmm. i headed to the i head to the office and uh, he hands me the script and like this is for you and i've never looked back ever since wow and so it's it's a passion for you it is it is yeah. and can you describe how it's like the entire process from beginning to end of filming do you also do the editing too as well no i don't do editing i haven't yeah. i haven't got into the editing part because for yeah. me uh being a very i would say an empty glass yeah that that was be that has been filling as as it as it progresses yeah because for me it started off as managing the set mm-hmm. managing the talent managing the time and that was my day one at set yeah I, i was not even aware what i was what what my title was yeah till we wrapped and the next day when we were following up and he said so what you did yesterday was assistant direction so i'm yeah. like oh i'm an ad i'm like okay okay because I, i was always here in interviews that you know the ad was like this the ad was this the ad does this mm-hmm. and um and we had not spoken about anything i just joined the set and mm. <clears throat> and after that it, it is more of a passion and yeah. i would say i realized this during one uh, one shoot we were doing mm-hmm. it was during the lockdown the lockdown had recently opened and uh we were getting back like not getting back but we were still in a curfew of 7 6 or 7 pm and we shot for one day mm. we shot we began at 4:30 we shot till 5 and uh after that we the way that the way it was hectic that day i realized that night i was like if someone does not have passion for filmmaking they mm. can't do it yeah hey bro i'm just trolling it's something that will not just challenge your perspective but also touch your heart and soul. It's a book that defies convention, blending art and literature into a thought-provoking masterpiece. A reflective piece of provocative art that tackles societal constructs from angles you've never considered. Hey bro, I'm just trolling delves into the very essence of our existence. It questions the technology that surrounds us, challenges our notions of beauty, stares unflinchingly into the eyes of death, and questions the boundaries of freedom. It scrutinizes the educational system that molds our very future. This book is a journey, an exploration of shared human experience, and it's a work of art that refuses to be confined by tradition. It's a canvas painted with words, a melody of thought, and a testament to the power of creativity in a world dominated by algorithms and data. Visit moonboycapitalventures.com and get your hands on Hey Bro, I'm just trolling today. It's not just a book. It's a movement. Now let's jump back into the show. When it comes to because you you've lived or I'm certain that you've traveled to like western society. Where have you been in western society? Uh outside I've been to Netherlands, been okay. to Belgium, Germany, uh, okay. almost about 7 to 8 countries in Europe. How does it compare to you versus how it is here? I, I would say it's more fast. Like it's yeah. fast paced. Yeah. It's more in order. I would say like you cannot really compare it. Mhm. um i would say it's just more uh, 
there is no comparison. I, I would mm. really not be able to come unless they, there is a lot of convenience in certain countries that I've been to. Yeah, transportation wise, food delivery wise, because mm. I I'm I'm a big fan of convenience. Yeah, like if I was to even to compare to Nairobi. Yeah, Nairobi is a very convenient city. Really, like you don't have to move. You can stay indoors mm. for over three months. Wow. Not in having to move out and you'll get everything on your doorsteps. Wow. And I'm a big fan of that that kind of thing. Yeah. I love moving out. I love moving out and, you know, visiting places. And mm. But then there are times when you want to be indoors, when you want to, when you just wish things would be brought to you. Yeah. And, yeah. I think people are more, what I've noticed in Africa specifically, they're more friendly, more smiley. Yeah. Whereas in like, I've lived in Western Europe, I lived in Germany for five years and just traveled around all of Western Europe. And I've also, I grew up in the States. So mm -hmm. I would say the, it's more open is what I would say is a little bit of the differences and nuances between it. And obviously the climate maybe plays a role because you know, when, when you're dealing with colder climates, usually typically the people's personalities tend to reflect that. I don't know if you would agree with that. I, I, I would actually agree with that a lot. Yeah, because I I have a friend from Germany. Yeah, and she's from the south, yeah. the southern. She's from the uh, south of Germany, and we were having this chat over coffee one day, and then yeah. like people from southern part, like it's since it's the it's a warmer part, yeah. warmer region, people are warmer as well. Mm -hmm. If uh, compared to guys who would come from the northern side of Germany, like Hamburg, mm -hmm. they would be more colder, like much colder and then you know not very welcoming or not very warm yeah but on the other hand if you see people from warmer countries uh tend to be warm i, I do agree with you on that the media <laughs> i would I, I would not really would say i'm not a big fan of media me neither i'm not into media i don't watch news me neither which is because more sometimes like i this this happens a lot in my crew like I, I would just share on news and they're like, and where have you been when this, this, this happened three days ago? I'm like, really? I'm like, okay. So I'm, I'm oh, not, I'm not man. a big uh, media yeah. person. I would say most of the news that I get would be from someone or somewhere. Yeah. Like if my colleague is talking about something and they yeah. talk about media and then yeah. something going on, maybe I, I do follow up on the current affairs and yeah. things that are happening, but I would say I'm not a big media person. Me neither. You know, I think as I've, I've spoken about this in the past that we're entering toward is, or we're already in the stage of like decentralized information. Mm. And like even me, you know, I put out content, you know, to showcase the realities of how countries are, you know, because I think a lot of times the media tries to push an agenda and it's so strong, the programming sometimes, it makes people so much fearful to come to anywhere in Africa, you know, because they just jumble Africa all into one and they don't realize that there's differences and nuances between each different country in Africa. And I'm glad that, you know, we're having this interview right now because you're able to tell me the exact truth. Also, because I don't want to just be the one that's a little bit speaking bias right. from my experiences only, but it's good that you're able to say basically the same things as what I'm saying too as well, because I'm, I'm seeing people, foreigners, jogging 9 p.m. with headphones on unbothered and if you tell this to somebody in the west it'd be like oh you're full of crap didn't they come off a war not knowing the war was so long ago and i don't know how we can change this narrative you know with people not understanding that there's really really well developed and organized areas in africa but i don't know if you have any kind of way in which you think it's just okay we need to just decentralize continue decentralizing information keep pushing 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 information out to the people and having the alternative forms of media um do you think we should just abolish the mass media as a whole or what do you think that we can do to create more awareness i think uh to create more awareness um the, the campaigns have already been rolled out yeah like uh visit rwanda visit campaign. rwanda, visit yeah, rwanda yeah. campaign i mean yeah. it's, it's it's a massive hit huge it's yeah. it's on the, the elite soccer players and mm -hmm. all these football teams yeah and i think uh, rwanda is seeing a boom in the tourism mm -hmm. and i think people are now getting to know rwanda better yes 
on on not even Rwanda but Africa in general like yeah. I would say if you leave a f- everything has a good and bad yeah. everything has a negative positive but I would say in this uh, part of I've actually had a had a friend of mine who speaking about the same thing mm-hmm. like when they would come like when they were told that okay because these are these are volunteers mm-hmm. who would come and they are like ah we were we were told like you know Rwanda it's like this and they are mentioned like it was in a war and then you know people lost lives and like will it be safe i'm like of course it's safe i'm yeah. like i mean i as you mentioned like jogging around at 9am 9pm yeah. with headphones yeah apart from the staring part yeah that is that is one thing yeah, <laughs> apart, yeah. apart from the staring like yeah. you get stared at a lot and then yeah but otherwise there's there's no harm Dude, the staring thing I think is is quite common not just here but also in Germany. Mhm. So I live in Germany, man. They stare if not as hard even maybe even harder. You know, and I think they do similar thing where you know, you catch them staring and they just continue staring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do that too in Germany as well. So I, and it's also in it's not, it's also in Eastern Europe actually. Mm-hmm. They do stare too as well there. But I think it's more out of curiosity. And I don't know why they stare here specifically if it's curiosity or just a culture to just look at people. Um I'm also I'm trying to figure that out. Really? Yeah, I'm all, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out cuz yeah. uh, I haven't I haven't yet figured it out cuz I like I stare back and like I, I sometimes end up having a conversation with the way. Yeah. It has been times when uh, I remember this incident early this year we were we were we were fair, we were shooting, we yeah. were doing a photo shoot and uh, the scenario was uh, the lady is a tourist and she is peeping out of the car and taking a selfie mm-hmm. and uh, we were setting up the scene and uh, this guy who was on a bicycle mm-hmm. and he looks at her stairs 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 and then he crashes damn and like to a point where when one forgets about his safety yes i would say is not very healthy yes and um, if there would be i think this is what what makes I think people make up a country yeah. and I think staring being a part of it makes up a country. So I yeah. think it's in something which is maybe internal mm-hmm. or like maybe they were they were not they were not taught that you know staring is something yeah. which is not right or like you know you do like you can glance yeah. you can look at someone but you you don't stare. Yeah. The networking here. Mm-hmm. Why is it so easy to network? I think it's that that people are very open. Yeah. And people want to know other people. Yeah. And I would say people end up knowing like everyone knows everyone. That's that's one of the the slogans in Kigali. Hmm. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows everyone. Yeah. Wow. But is it like this cuz you've been to other African nations too as well as the networking the same? I would say the the ones that I've been to yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I think Africa in general people are like very open and uh very friendly as as you earlier mentioned yeah yeah like they just want they see you and they're like ah let's talk to this person yeah like let's get to know this person even yeah. if the other person might not be that open yeah they'll make the other person open up yeah so yeah. i have i've come across that i have uh, like i've come across people who can talk to literally anyone yeah like people say that i'm i i can talk to anyone and i'm like no you haven't met certain people mm-hmm. who can talk to actually anyone yeah so you're vegetarian Yes. How has that been in terms of making your rounds here specifically? Is it easy? Uh um, my my dad has a restaurant. So my my There we go. My, There we go. <laughs> my my father was assigned chef at uh, No Hotel. Okay. That was that was I think one if not the fi- first five star hotel mm-hmm. or the, the first intercontinental hotel mm-hmm. and he was moved from Bangkok mm. to Rwanda. to train the chefs wow back in 98 wow and uh, and after his uh, contract ended mm. he opened up an indian restaurant because mm. that was something which was not in the country because indians would come and i remembered indians coming well indians we carry food everywhere we go but uh, so he opened up a restaurant and i remember people bringing in raw material they would bring rice and wheat flour and all these things so that they can cook mm-hmm. but once they come to know about the restaurant they're like ah no we don't need to cook anymore so yeah. and i think most of my time I, most of my upbringing most of my growing up 
I would always eat at his restaurant. Makes sense. All the time. And now as, as the cultures have progressed, as the country has progressed, there are more vegetarian optional restaurants in mm-hmm. Rwanda. There are also vegan options now. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about that. So for someone that's vegetarian and would want to move here, you would recommend them your dad's restaurant? I would recommend them my What's dad's the restaurant. It's called Punjabi Turka. Punjabi Turka. Check yeah. it out, guys. And uh, not only that, but there are also other vegetarian restaurants. Oh, so it's common yeah. here. Now it is. It's becoming common, especially with uh, with the Western people coming in and mm. the veganism going on and yeah, yeah. all this thing. So there are a number of vegetarian options now. Okay. Uh, my, my crew is mostly vegetarian. Wow. Okay. And would you say it's more expensive or... It's, it's, it's fairly, it's almost the same. Almost the same yeah. as the normal prices? All the normal prices. And you can also get stuff at the store? That's, you can, okay. very yeah. easily. Like the synthetic meats and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I would say they're not really big on the synthetic meat. Yeah. But I think, uh, as I would say, non-vegetarians would agree, yeah. meat is meat. Yeah. Like you, you can't uh, replicate meat. Mm-hmm. Like if it's synthetic, it's, it's synthetic. It's not yeah. meat. Yeah. <laughs> like soy is not meat. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Or yeah, like yeah. plant-based meat is not meat. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can get the texture, but again, it's more uh, processed. It's yes. more uh, more preservatives. It's more chemicals. So Absolutely. it's not healthy. Absolutely. And uh, no disrespect to the non-vegetarian community. They have their own choices. We have our own. Yeah. I've remembered my uh, my non-vegetarian friend telling me that, and Keth, you need to stop eating my food's food. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, man. So, okay. Yeah. And I would also say, I would say recently I dated, an, I dated a vegan lady mm-hmm. from Italy. And uh, she mentioned that uh, most of the, the food... Mm-hmm in Rwanda as well, is vegan. Mm. Like most of the lower class consumption, because they have rice, they have beans, they have this dish called kaunga, made from maize flour. Mm. They make tomato sauce, Mm -hmm. soup, tomato Mm -hmm. soup sauce to to go with it. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, peas, carrots. The only non-vegetarian part in a Rwandan food yeah. Is the beef or the meat. Yeah. If you disregard the meat, it's mostly vegan. Yeah. Wow. Like people don't really think about it yeah. that way, but yeah. if you if you get time to think about it, it's actually true. Yeah. Like if you if you remove the meat from a Rwandan diet, mm-hmm. most of the food they're getting is vegan. It's vegan. Yeah. I've I've tried to go vegetarian actually um a couple of times. All right, how did that go? <laughs> I failed. <laughs> Long story short, you know. Um but I, I do, I'm starting to see, because when, when I'm in that state of eating, you know, outside of eating meat and just eating more vegetables and more fruits and, you know, alternatives, I do see a shift in my body, actually. It's actually more energetic, mm-hmm. surprisingly. Um, but I get that craving, and I think that that comes with discipline, right? And I think that I lack the discipline to do it long term. So it's something I need to put my energy and mind to do it long term so it's sustainable. So I think like once things start dying down for me, because right now I'm, I'm super busy with so many different projects that I'm working on, I think I want to put more of an emphasis on just subsistence farming and learning more about food and how to live a more sustainable lifestyle with nutrition and everything like that. Because that's somewhere where I'm lacking. It's like a weakness for mine. So that's why I would say how, how it was for me. But... Yeah. Now, I'd I'd say it's more about again willpower. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of people say that uh, we we can't live without meat. We can't mm-hmm. like especially on a on a buffet when me and my other friends mm-hmm. when we are serving. I'm like, and okay, how can you not eat meat? I'm like, it's just uh, I'm like, how can you eat meat? Yeah. I'm like ah, you know, it's this and that. But again, it's it's more about discipline, as you've mentioned. Yeah. It's more about willpower. Yeah. And vegetarianism, it's more uh, on the healthier part. There is also a spiritual part to it. Yeah. Because uh, it was taught to us in yoga school mm. uh, that when you when you kill an animal for yeah. consumption, it sends out bad vibes. Yeah. So that the younger audience will understand the and it's not in the right state because it's like it's being killed Mm -hmm. and if you are being killed as a person you would not say good things about the person who's killing you yeah 
and that's what the same thought that's it's the same thought process that animals also go through yeah and uh, once they once they are passed away and they have been consumed they still contain that that bad aura in it mm-hmm. which is being consumed by human yeah it makes sense you know like i'm a very open person so um actually this girl I used to talk to she was a uh, vegetarian and that's when it started opening my mind a bit expanding it and thinking about the spiritual and you know the souls and everything like that so for me i'm still on the quest and on the journey of learning and continuously learning to figure out what's the right approach but i'm always questioning everything you know i think that's the where you have to start is to question everything mm-hmm. and seek answers and ask a bunch of questions and then once you get another answer ask more and more questions and go deeper and deeper and further until you find the core of what you consider the truth to be so it's very interesting for me but i i do want to pivot um into back to photography and you filmmaking because you said that you've done various a plethora of different films i want to ask you what's your main target demographic is it just here in rwanda so uh our main demographic the target so it's it's more about the topic yeah that we cover yeah and we have covered various topics from agriculture energy sector mm. medical oxygen well, that was one of the most interesting one yeah for me because i i get to learn a lot like we get to learn a lot as crew and and all this i would say it's for spreading awareness yeah it's also about uh, spreading awareness about africa to the west mm. and also about west to africa yeah that's that's more of it and then i think most of this uh, the documentaries that we do are appeal to the corporate world mm. so that because uh, those at the end of the day those are the the decision makers for certain people and then those are the decision makers for uh, funding yeah so that funds can be bought into the nation and for projects and yeah. for the people who are there yeah. people who actually need it yeah absolutely man dude <laughs> i just want to say thank you so much for coming on uh where can people find you on the internet um on, they can find me on my instagram yeah it's aniket.uke okay i'll leave I, links down below i appreciate you do you have any closing thoughts before we go i would say this has been great i yeah. it has been my very first uh, podcast yeah i'm i'm a big talker i yeah. i talk a lot yeah <laughs> and i think that's why i i have been uh, switching careers from marketing to stand up comedy mm. to now filmmaking and i think filmmaking was my calling yeah and i think uh, now that i recall back back in i would say 2003 that i had I had finished with my tuitions and mm-hmm. when I entered my room and there was a making of a film mm-hmm. going on on the television yeah and I was more fascinated by the film making process yeah than the film itself wow so I think that got uh, stuck with me mm-hmm. and I think it was a it was a wish of a child that has now come true after 20 years wow Well, we'll leave off there, man. I appreciate your time. This concludes another great episode of the Mooncast, man, and peace.